On the current acceptable, in fact, at the outset, let me thank the organizers and uh, good morning, chairpersons, for that nice invitation uh, to give me this opportunity to speak on preventable aspects or pre preventable strategies for OHSS. I'm sure um, there are not many people in the hall, but since I've been asked to and we'll keep in time, uh, this is a nitrogenic serious life-threatening complication of controlled ovarian hyperstimulation. Basically, an exaggerated response, which happens uh, subsequent to a COH. And of course, the pathophysiology is protein. There are a lot of factors, primarily vasoactive angiogenic substances, which are increasing the vascular permeability. But basically, it is a self-resolving syndrome. Uh, I'm sure there was a lecture yesterday on the incidences. I won't really go in detail, but I'll just say that the pathogenesis of the problem basically involves uh, excess of VEGF, which comes from the follicles, subsequent to an HCG exogenous as well as the endogenous uh, HCG because it has a long half-life, and that's the culprit which is increasing the vascular permeability, increasing the fluid uh, to the third space, and that's what creates havoc and the nuisance of OHSS. Now, basically, it is these VGF and the other vasoactive interleukins which are increasing the capillary permeability, which ultimately lead to all the imbalances, and then culminating into a severe form with which we all dread as complications of OHSS. Now, again, I really wouldn't really take you through these uh, uh, the, the classifications of an early and late and of course on severity because there are a lot of classification systems that have come up over the years right from the ones which came from uh, Rabau and then it was Golan and then it was Risk and lately I think the one by Navot is the one which we all really prefer because it is the one which is really talked on severe and critical OHSS which really is the one which is, is, is what is appreciated now on terms of uh, you know severity. Now, so coming straight on the prevention strategies, that's what I thought I would stress on. We should understand there is a primary prevention and secondary, i.e. prevention means where we could identify women who are at risk of developing OHSS. Again, primary, those strategies we, we know well in advance before we start the stimulation on, on prevention. And of course, secondary is once those problems are setting in or the woman is likely to go in during the control over stimulation, those strategies that could be sort of helping us in, in, in during the course of stimulation. So coming on to, to the first aspect of primary prevention, that means identifying the woman at risk, and this is equally important, and that is by identifying those as primary or secondary. That means those who've come to you before the controlled ovarian stimulation, vis-a-vis -vis secondary, that means during the, the event of controlled stimulation, you would identify those risk factors. Of course, women who are having a previous episode of OHSS are the ones who are definitely at risk, besides the ones we know, low BMI, young age groups, PCOS. Secondary are the ones where we know they're the ones during the control and stimulation showing rising levels of E2, occurring more than 15 follicles, or the ones where you have 20 to 25 follicles around the day of trigger. Of course, depending on whether she got HCG for the, st for the luteal support, and of course, once they become pregnant. Now, during the course of uh, stimulation, you identify these women. I think the ones that we really know, we should know that we can identify them right at the first visit. You could identify them on the day of, uh, during the course of stimulation, of course, you could identify them even before you do an embryo transfer. And of course, andral follicle count and the AMH are the ones which have been coming up, and I think all of us in the IVF units are identifying these with good s sensitivity. And of course, specificity is a little variable for AMH, but then it's a good marker because those women who have a high AMH, who got high AFC, are the ones that can be picked up well before uh, their IVF cycle. Well, how about the levels of E2? No exact levels defined, but any woman who's getting a level more than 3,000 is the one where we could identify them. But then as such, E2 is a poor predictor. Then of course, there are all those number of follicles, more than 13 follicles, which are more than 15 or more than 18 follicles in total, and the likes. Of course, we have follicular fluid VGF and other parameters, but I don't think anyone of us is doing the VGF levels in clinical settings. So if we look at the criteria for defining a patient at risk of OHSS during the course, I think these are some which the ASRM bulletin gave in its guidelines in 2008. Any woman with an E2 level of more than 3,000 to 4,000, number of follicles which are more than 15 millimeters beyond 20 or 25 in both ovaries, and of course VGF, but then these are the ones which 
overall they say have got poor predictability so there's no real cutoff but these are the ones which are arbitrarily given by the american society of reproductive medicine now of course we know prevention is better than cure so let's look at preventions which could be done there that means while we are on the stimulation protocol that means primarily those where we could really identify them we know that they are risk factors and then we could go about that means before we initiate we could take these precautions and of course secondary are the ones which we take during the course of co that means the stimulation has started so of course primarily is reducing the dosages choosing the protocols of course going in for in vitro maturations and sen insulin sensitized that means you have actually planned these well before you you sort of know ohs is developing that means in anticipation you have done and of course there are a whole lot of them and i'll take you through quickly through each one of them now individualizing protocols we know that the protocols which really work good for uh, avoiding ohs is the antagonist protocol if there is a is, is a thought of agonist i think dual suppression with oc pills on the type of gonadotropins and the dosages we know that we're going to use them smaller doses even at times as low as 75 iu and when we have to increase we probably go in a very slow fashion and of course increasing and at times even stepping down whether urinary or recombinant are better i think recombinant is what most data says but a meta analysis puts a doubt and doesn't say that they really reduce the risk of ohss and of course this wonderful rct which came from the greek group clearly says that the flexible antagonist protocol in pco is the one which is more uh, uh, useful and the incidence of ohss was much lower in this group of patients of course the cochrane has reiterated this and this is by uh, the 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 egyptian group of albugar and al inani which clearly says that of the 45 rcts they found that there was significant lower incidences of ohss when the antagonist group of patients were compared with the agonist and this was the conclusion they say that no reduction in the uh, live birth rate but a significant reduction in the risk of ohss when antagonist protocols were used now the next thing while we are doing our controlled ovarian stimulation is and we know we are identifying women and she's likely to go it is looking at coasting and basically coasting means withholding gonadotropins uh, and before they sort of uh, start peaking and the idea is that we st stop and at times even we reduce the dosages of uh, gonadotropins and what is the real safe level at which you start coasting is not defined but any woman with levels going up to 4000 is the one we start coasting and then when they go beyond 4 days is what we say we should cancel because any coasting log in that 4 days we know that the outcome is going to be lower of course early or late follicular depending on the size and how early you can pick up is uh, is again the two types um, uh, of coastings you could do it when the levels uh, are there with follicles of 20 to 15 is early and late when the lead follicles are beyond 15 or 16 is what you'd call as a late coasting now what about coasting and the cochrane it says that and this perhaps is the cochrane which has come in 2011 but this says that there was no evidence to suggest the use of coasting to prevent ohss compared to no coasting how if you really read this uh, this this meta analysis on the cochrane there was actually a lot of variation in heterogeneity in the way the coasting was done so perhaps in the subsequent meta analysis of cochrane we could probably get a better idea about whether coasting helps or doesn't because this one doesn't really really put a lot of value on coasting now the next thing during the 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 process of controlled ovarian hyperstimulation what could help reduce is the use of antagonist trigger and i think this is one thing which uh, use of agonist trigger in the antagonist cycle and this is something which is very fantastic we know that we using hcg but the benefits of agonist is that it definitely in contrast to hcg it produces a short duration of lh surge and therefore you can initiate the maturation but then the corpus lutea regress immediately so the corpus lutea which is the culprit to produce uh you know a lot of e2 and progesterone is the one which is regressed and therefore this is the one which helps and we know that the 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 very idea of agonist trigger is acting by luteolysis and but the very important thing one should realize is that when you give this agonist trigger there is a havoc and there is a nuisance and a luteal support has to be very aggressive it's going to be talked in subsequent lectures but it's very important that you give a very very aggressive luteal support of course there are a lot of differences in the dosages the way you give the recommended is if you're using luprolide it's 1 mg in fact later literature in 2014 is even suggesting up to 2 mg of luprolide of course boostrolin is there in units which use triprolinin there is an ongoing trial looking at various doses of 0.1 0.2 0.4 but i think the most commonly used is the 0.2 mg of triprolinin 
So what are the other alternatives to preventing in the control of it? Could you use recommend LH? Yes. In yesterday talk it was there. But remember if you use recommend LH, the, it works primarily like agonist trigger. But then the cost is humongous and therefore we don't use it. Could we use lower dosages? Yes. There are some studies which point that reducing the trigger of its by dosages could help in, in this thing. Let's look at the other strategies of cryofreezing or IVM. Now cryofreezing basically means that you have counsel the patient well in advance and it's, I think that's what is a good idea but in our setups to sell the patient you've gone to the entire IVF and look you're not going to put back a single embryo back is something which really comes as a root shock to the couple so this is very important but then this is one strategy which may be used in difficult situations and therefore this could be one of the preventive strategies of OHSS but then again on the Cochrane they says there's an Inevident, is, is insufficient evidence to support the routine use of cryopreservation and for the relative merits. In fact, again, this is a Cochrane which has come in 2012, but subsequent studies to this definitely, definitely support that agonist trigger and cryopreservation is the way forward for preventing OHSS. Now, a word about IVM, though we are not really, really having many units in India who are doing in vitro maturation, but the idea is that you kind of pick up the oocytes at the immature M1 stage, mature them, and then go about doing an ICSI and embryo transfer. Definitely, it has got a benefits uh, of reducing the risk of OHSs, but remember, this is something which has got a lot of technical aspects. A lab which is not only this technical aspect of picking the oocytes at 10 to 12 millimeters, but a level of lab which can really really have a standard to meet in vitro maturation uh, strategy so that's very important and then perhaps you could perform the embryo transfer either in the same or the next cycle but definitely ICSI has to be done on this in vitro matured uh, you know uh, oocytes that you take now let's look at the word about pharmacotherapy that means while you're having the control over in hyperstimulation could you give some kind of medications and then this is about preventive, I'm not talking of treatment, because we do give HES and we do give albumin once they develop purchases. But on the prevention, I think there were two Cochrane's. The first came in 2002 by the same group of Albugar, and then there was the second one which came from the same group uh, in 2012. While the first one said that it is beneficial, the same group when they were reviewed later literature said that there was just a borderline decrease. That means if you do give albumin on the day of pickup, it perhaps doesn't make a significant difference. It only decreases by a borderline difference. It's not a huge difference. Whereas on the use of uh, HES, which is hydroxyethyl starch, uh, this is the one which is shown in the meta-analysis by Cochrane to show a significant reduction. It, this is the one which is on IV fluids, nine RCTs, a huge number of patients where HES versus placebo was used and they said that there was a limited benefit from the use of IV albumin on the day of pickup but definite reduction in the, in the uh, uh, group which got HES. So HES is the one which is showing benefit. However, there was no change in the, far, in, in, in the pregnancy rates. I really won't talk about dopamine because the next lecture is on dopamine. But this is one thing which is again a very useful uh, you know, uh, preventive strategy because it reduces the levels of VGF by impeding phosphorylation. Of course, the dosages is what we know and going to be talked. doesn't affect implantation or fertilization rates. And if we look at this beautiful meta-analysis, which clearly says that there was significant reduction in the OHSS when cabagolin was started. In fact, we're getting to use this more and more often to reduce the risk of OHSS. Uh, of course, on the use of metformin, not a lot of work, but then this is the initial work which came from uh, Tang's group, and these are the ones who are pioneer in this. They say that... This is something which is of a good strategy of giving 850 milligrams twice a day starting from the day of down regulation. In fact, as later as a down regulated cycle also is good, but some units are using about two to four weeks prior to even down regulation. And this is shown to have the short term, you know, addition of metformin is also a, a, a medication which could reduce the risk of or prevent OHSS. So this is one of the uh, strategies. So now looking at OHSS, I think it's not just one kind of strategy which works, not one kind of thing, there are many facets. While there are many facets to the syndrome, there are very many facets on prevention uh, uh, of OHSS and I think it's not one thing which works. So I think as a clinician, as a, a lab person, or for that matter, as a counsellor, it's a teamwork. So you have to really sit down to look at everything and I think as 
the start, we have to look at AFC and AMH so as to identify those women at risk, give them lower dosages of gonadotrophin, perhaps not just coasting, you could even start tapering the dosages once you really know that this is a woman who is going to go in for HSS. Of course, with, uh, I'm sorry, it's, it's, it's an agonist trigger, it's not the antagonist. In an antagonist protocol, an agonist trigger and freeze all. I think these two are the ones which this uh, Spanish group from IVI Valencia, they say that the combination of antagonist and uh, uh, antagon sorry, it's agonist trigger and freeze all is the one which gives the maximum protection to our patients. Now, just while just I could sum up this talk, I think there are a lot of lot of gray areas on saying which is the best evidence and which is the preventable, uh, you know, sort of thing which works. And Peter Homedain's article clearly, which was a, a, a kind of an again a meta-analysis, says that there is a lot of shortage on large randomized trials. But if you read through this, it says the preventive strategies which appear to be highly effective are an antagonist mm -hmm. protocol, use of agonist mm -hmm. okay. uh, for, for oocyte maturation, and of course, dopamine agonists are, are the ones, gabagolin are the ones which have emerged as the best strategy. And while he puts his paper and he really analyzes the level of evidence, because I know you all know what is the level of evidence, level 1A being the best and, and subsequently level up to level 1A, 1B, which is treated the best. And if you look at all the best pr preventive strategies, the level 1A is the GNR antagonist protocols, which we have accepted. Of course, avoiding HCG, again, a level 1A evidence, which is the best coming from meta-analysis of randomized trials. Insulin sensitizers being put as 1A, 2A, because this is again coming up in a big way. Costing again a level 1A, that means it's a very good quality evidence. This is useful. Using GNRH agonist triggers, again, 1B, because it is reducing the risk of, of, of uh, OHSS. Cryopreservation, again, level 1A, that means it's meta-analysis from randomized trial. And if you look at it, they put albumin from his data, though the Cochrane doesn't sort of support it. And of course, dopamine agonists, which are again coming up. So if you look at the level of evidence, these are some of the strategies which have sort of been accepted. So I would just conclude that OHSS can be avoided, though it is not completely preventable. One can avoid it. Identify your woman at risk. Define your protocols and dosages while without, uh, you know, sort of uh, shying out from uh, the protocols. Reduce dosages, antagonist protocols, costing are options. Of course, agonist triggers, HES, metformin, and very important, a combination of strategies what works. And of course, I think for all of us who are sort of doing IVF, it's very relevant in the present day to audit our cycles. You know, audit is one thing which will tell us what is our practice in our unit and how we can. And of course, the goal of all clinicians should be to move to an OHSS-free ART clinic. Thank you very much.